Up next is going to be the Richmond Strategic Multimodal Plan presentation. Ken Mobley, amongst others. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, neither of those look like Ken. Good evening. I'm Victoria Batcher. I'm with the Department of Economic and Community Development, and this is Tom Flynn with Public Works, and we are the co-project managers on the Richmond Strategic Multimodal Transportation Plan, which we want to present to you today. Um, we provided an update to this body uh, with the uh, Land Use and Transportation Committee meeting. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm on the ground here. Um, a couple of um, many months ago, and then also with the budget process last year. So we wanted to come forward and present this to you again. We're at our final stage with this. It's a draft plan, so we do uh, are we are very interested in your input on this. Um, we presented to the city uh, planning commission again uh, today. Uh, Ms. Graciana gets to uh, go again on this. Um, Anyway, back in 1997, the city did a, a transportation plan, and then it was later absorbed into the master plan of 2000, and that's exactly the process that we're following right now. Um, a lot has changed in transportation over the years. A lot has changed in, in land use over the years. We didn't have complete streets back in 1997, or at least we didn't have it as a, as a specialty. So, um, so this is a very different plan. So the steps are to go through this. We do have some, a public meeting coming forward. We do have a website that has um, links on there for public input as well. Uh, the City Planning Commission, when they adopt and undertake their update to the master plan, they will be looking at many of the items here, and then it would be formally incorporated in there, and then come back to you at that time. So. That's excellent. One thing I just want to point out, um, <clears throat> a lot of our members are very technologically savvy and are posting things on their websites or on Facebook or Twitter, what have you. And I'm going to get myself into the habit of asking any presenter uh, to council at any meeting to provide soft copies within a week, okay. um, just so by Friday of this week, so that those that want to post on their websites to get that information out to their constituents sure. makes life easier on everybody. So by soft copies? Soft copies. Okay. Soft copies instead of the hard gotcha. yeah, copies. No, we hard didn't want to paper. kill a couple trees on this, but, but we did want you to be informed. So what you have are three handouts. One is a presentation that we'll be presenting tonight. The second is the executive summary. And then the third is the chapter seven, which gets into the implementation of the plan. And this, has, this is project specific. So with that, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. okay, I'll turn it over to Ken Mobley and Scudder Wag with um, Baker. And Baker has done this throughout the country uh, for similar programs and really taking their, their transportation um, uh, infrastructure and their transportation strategies to a different level. And, and I'll turn this over to Ken at this point. Okay, thank you. Oh, supposed to be doing something. Yes, Vicki will be <laughs> doing the slides. <laughs> thank you very much. We're, we're excited to be here and, and present some of our draft findings. We're both out of our Richmond office, so it's good to uh, be here locally. Um, so if we get started, the first thing we wanted to sort of talk about is what we'll go over. Uh, again, we really are producing the draft plan. It has not been publicly released at this point. Uh, it has been reviewed internally. We've been working with an internal stakeholder uh, committee uh, of city uh, professionals. And then we do have an advisory group uh, of various stakeholders, environmental agencies, the transit agency, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, they have reviewed this in draft form as well. What I'll do tonight is I'll talk about guiding principles. We had a very open and public process to come up with principles that would be important to the residents of, of the city of Richmond. They're final in the sense, not that we can't edit them, it really is a draft document, but in the sense that we got a lot of input on how citizens think we should rank projects and what's important to them in transportation in Richmond. So we prioritize those as part of our process in this, and I'll present that. We will very briefly go over some maps in the matrix. Obviously, it's a large document, uh, nearly impossible to present in a short time frame. So we'll give you the highlights. This is really the highlights of some of the recommendations and what we've heard through this planning process. Next. Um, Again, we presented to uh, the Planning Commission uh, this morning. Basically, as we move forward, we do have a public meeting that will be an open workshop. Uh, that's uh, scheduled tentatively, and we think we're pretty set on that for April 11th. 
Uh, again, we'll have the same information. It will still be draft, looking for input on the information overall. Uh, we will then uh, sit down with Vicki and Tom and revise the plan as needed. Uh, our schedule is to try and wrap things up in the May time frame. Again, depending on the significance of the comments and the interest, we will be flexible as to, to what we need to do for that overall. When we think about uh, the studies we've done, and we've done technical evaluations, a whole series of the existing transportation system, what demand will look like 30 years into the future for the city and the region overall. There are really five areas that consistently came up in terms of needs that we need to improve. The first is multimodal alternatives. Um, so really thinking about additional transit, additional ways to bike, additional sidewalks, just different modes of transportation within the city of Richmond. Uh, the analysis shows the, the system performs very well for moving cars and moving vehicles primarily. There are still some congested corridors. There are still safety problems. But as a region, we do pretty well from that perspective. It's some of the other pieces that can be improved. The second big piece is what has been called complete streets. Um, there are lots of different names over the years. Sometimes they're called great streets. It's the concept that a street is more than pavement for cars to drive on. It is something that connects neighborhoods. It's something that you live on, you walk on, you bike on. It should do more than just move a car. And that really, one of our recommendations is that the city of Richmond adopt a complete streets policy moving forward. The third, we continue in fundamental transportation planning. Uh, there are safety needs. There are places where we need to do some things at intersections, uh, where there are corridors that there are high accident rates, access points onto and off of the interstate that continue to have uh, poor performance. So there are safety needs as well. Fourth, sustainable transportation. Uh, you're all probably familiar with some of the sustainability moves, trying to get people out of single occupant vehicles. Uh, giving people more opportunity to walk, thinking about different ways of capturing water from streets through different technologies makes it more sustainable. So we have that in as well. And the third, we did hear consistently about the need for improved access and mobility. There are definitely pockets within the city of Richmond that cannot get to the emerging job centers, some of them outside of the city of Richmond. And so we have recommendations for things like regional equity networks, transit improvements to link those places better in the future. Thanks. Um, we came up with a series of guiding principles. They actually came out of our stakeholder group. Uh, we asked them to tell us what was important to think about because some transportation plans is just a huge list of projects. And so we were asked in our scope of work to prioritize those for the city so that you knew which projects were the most important going first. So we, we had a whole series of input on that, a digital survey, hand presented at meetings. Uh, overall, our vision has stayed the same. We presented this publicly, I think, three times now as a vision statement, really thinking about the movement of people and goods, uh, a multimodal system in the sense that though all of those seams and interactions work. Right now, there's some separation between your modes. And trying to make them work better is a big influence. And really thinking about giving travel choices for all users that there are still needs to connect certain users, make it accessible to everyone. As we went through the process, two principles, um, we were really directed, rose to the top. So any sort of projects or policies that could improve safety was a fundamental need and went to the top of sort of our prioritization list overall. The second was really thinking about system preservation. The city has tremendous needs for additional funding for basics, sidewalks, roads, pavement, bridge repair. So the, the philosophy of what you'll see in this plan is to use and improve what you have rather than necessarily new roads, new facilities that some planning processes will go into. So we really are looking at the system <coughs> in place and improving it. These are in order in terms of, of the input we received publicly and from our stakeholders overall. Uh, rising to the top, I talked about it again, can't say it enough, additional multimodal linkages. And those are specific projects, new modes in new places. Uh, right below that, the concept of complete streets. Uh, we have just tremendous amount of support from the public about creating uh, more complete streets overall. Third, right behind that, is equity. Thinking about equity and accessibility throughout uh, Poverty Commission and how we do that better uh, is one of the top things we're doing. 
The third, you had a little discussion a little while ago, was the need for regional transportation and regional cooperation, particularly for an effective transit system. As we move down the list, we have 10 principles overall. Sustainability was important to people, how we look at things from a sustainability perspective. Alternative mode support, this is a sort of technical, that deals with the need that land use may have to change to support some of these transit corridors. So it's thinking about the land use and policies that go along with transportation uh, was important, not as important as safety, for example, but still important. At the bottom, people did respect there are tremendous historic transportation resources with the river, the grid network, uh, a lot of the facilities, Main Street Station itself. Um, that's important to people overall. Uh, and then finally, we did, people will say we want to be innovative. So we have things in there like electric charging stations and some of those things. People didn't feel that was as important as some of the fundamental, we need basic access and modes. So those are the guiding principles that we use to sort of prioritize. Basically, what we then did is we came up with what are called MOEs, Measures of Effectiveness. And so we said, how would we tell if we're making a street more complete? Well, if we're adding a bikeway, if we're adding new transit service, you know, if we're improving the walkability of that street, it is more complete. So we then took, uh, we have about 150 individual projects that people suggested that we came up with that were in the works through a department or, or internally, and we prioritized them into saying, this is how well they fit, what the citizens are telling us and our stakeholders are telling us are important for the transportation system. So we group them into high, medium, or low. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the projects and present some of those in a matrix format. Again, we've had some shifting and some recommendations, uh, but it allows us to think about what's really important in the plan. So now at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Scudder, and he'll go over just some highlights of some of the, the projects from a mapping perspective. Right, as Ken said, this is a big document, so we're going to give you the kind of the highlight overview. Um, and to uh, Mr. Samuels' point, we will have a final draft, or not a final, but a draft document available for everyone to view um, on the website by next week, uh, which you can then download and, and look at the whole thing. But looking at the highlights of the draft recommendations, uh, the policies and projects, a uh, major element uh, of the recommendations is a, is a big improvement in uh, transit. Uh, going forward with the Broad Street BRT system, uh, and beyond that, uh, looking at uh, improvements in the transit system overall, more and better uh, local and express service, not just within the city, but across outside the city as well. And then identifying transit priority corridors, or actually implementing some transit priority corridors by um, putting higher level, higher frequency transit service out there, uh, and then moving forward with downtown transfer center and other transfer centers across the city to link up those local uh, and transit priority corridors. Uh, carrying forward complete streets policy by implementing additional modes onto some existing streets, making some um, improvements on some existing corridors to make them more complete. Uh, expansion and improvement of Main Street Station into a true multimodal hub uh, where people can bike, walk, catch a train, catch the bus, uh, and, and link up to pretty much all of the uh, modes um, in downtown. Uh, from the system preservation, but also from the complete streets perspective, is uh, we have a lot of bridges in the city. Uh, we're a river city, uh, and a lot of those bridges, uh, not necessarily all the ones across the river, but a number of them um, uh, have issues. We have a number of old railroad bridges that are structurally deficient. Um, but we also have some, such as the Boulevard Bridge, that have high demand for other modes that just can't handle that demand. So we have a number of recommendations for improvements to those bridges that are structurally deficient, uh, improvements and perhaps uh, adjustments to some of those bridges to make them more hospitable to, to other modes. Uh, downtown, we looked at the one-way to two-way conversion recommendations from the downtown master plan in more detail uh, and made some more detailed recommendations on that front, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we have a number of recommendations on the pedestrian bicycle front, um, working from the Pedestrian Bicycle and Trails Commission recommendations. We've kind of highlighted some of the high priority corridors we feel should be implemented uh, most quickly, and specifically, recommendation for a bicycle boulevard and cycle track on the east-west corridor, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, overall, as well, improvements including high-speed rail and other passenger rail improvements. Of course, that's not necessarily going to be led by the city, but the city might certainly be involved. 
uh, improved access to the Port of Richmond and, and in, the, in, in the area around there for uh, improved freight movement and, and economic development purposes. Uh, and then a variety of spot improvements for safety uh, and access needs uh, across the city. Um, so I'll kind of run through some of these maps. These maps don't cover any and every recommendation in the plan, but they kind of cover the major things. On transit, like I said, we have recommendations for transit priority corridors, um, really starting with the Broad Street BRT, but then continuing really across a lot of the major corridors uh, from downtown throughout the city. Uh, Midlothian, Hull, Jeff Davis, Chamberlain, Patterson Broad, uh, Nine Mile, Mechanicsville. Uh, really creating a network uh, of higher frequency routes, 10-15 minute frequencies, so people uh, really have the option to live without a car almost, really, if they want to in those corridors. Uh, and they can rely on it to be regular, consistent across the day. Uh, also on the rail side, obviously, carrying through the high-speed rail improvements, and we're going to be adding to this map the, uh, the other passenger rail uh, uh, improvements with new routes to Norfolk and Newport News. Norfolk already underway, expansion of uh, passenger rail to uh, Newport News. Uh, with the multimodal hub at Main Street Station really kind of tying that together, and transfer centers uh, at various points uh, around the city to tie together some of those transit priority corridors with local routes uh, and, and other routes in the system. Uh, on the bicycle front, uh, we've highlighted uh, in these darker, uh, heavier routes, kind of priority corridors that to connect major neighborhoods through to downtown and uh, activity centers uh, across the city. So north-south routes uh, from neighborhoods coming up and across the river, uh, east-west routes, and in particular, we are recommending on that, that kind of east-west spine route uh, through the fan and downtown, a bicycle boulevard, uh, and then a cycle track. A uh, bicycle boulevard is, is basically a low speed style street redesign to kind of reduce the amount of through traffic and the speed of through traffic, um, but not really eliminate vehicles, just make it much more comfortable for people to bike by bringing vehicles down to the speed of, of the bicyclists. Whereas a cycle track is more of a, a, a clear, dedicated facility that's buffered a little bit. So it, it's more than just a bike lane. It's a bike lane plus a little of extra space uh, for those higher speed corridors uh, through downtown. On some of the complete street recommendations, uh, some of these fall into the area of corridors where we see looking now and in the future there is some congestion. Um, and we need to try to manage that congestion with some targeted corridor improvements that try to manage the traffic, manage the demand, uh, and deal with it, but without really doing major writings. And in a way that is still um, you know, re reflective of the land use around those corridors uh, and, and sensitive to the, to the other modes that need those corridors. Uh, so improvements on Jank Road, um, Forest Hill east of Poet Parkway, you know, modest improvements like to the median and, and access that, um, that help manage the traffic um, and the, the access. Uh, Three Chop, Cary Street Road, and, and Brook Road, looking at more context sensitive solutions to address, particularly on Three Chop and Cary, the safety issues of, of, of other modes trying to use those corridors and those very, and the really tight constraints. Uh, and then we also have recommendations here for some of those corridors where there's excess capacity, where you know, looking even into the future, uh, there's plenty of capacity there for the vehicular traffic, so maybe we can repurpose some of the traffic lanes to bicycle lanes. Um, you have, for example, Grove Avenue. Um, the, the congestion is, is uh, not really a significant problem um, at all. Uh, and you have a number of parallel corridors as well for traffic, so there's a good, good opportunity there to perhaps repurpose two of the travel lanes for bicycle lanes. Similar Hermitage Road um, between the interstate and Broad Street. Um, so good opportunities there for creating more complete streets. Our philosophy on the complete streets is really that's where the city starts. Um, that rather than looking for traditional widenings, that, that is a choice that some municipalities will make. 
that really we're starting with complete streets, thinking about different ways to manage the streets uh, as, as part of that. One of the things we were asked to do was to come up with what's called street types. Um, street types are overlays that you would put over, and it really thinks about the land use that's along the corridor. And so it's something that, for example, if you're interested, Seattle has done extensively, a lot of the West Coast, uh, Austin, Texas, and really what it's doing is it's considering land uses upon it. We haven't gotten to the point where we've said every sidewalk needs to be four foot wide and every lane needs to be 11 foot wide. It's more of what does the street need to look like if I live on it and it serves a certain purpose but it has a certain land use characteristic. So I'll very quickly go over those right now. Uh, again, these are overlays. These are the general classifications, and we came up with sections so that people would know generally, and we'll be adding the map to show if this is the street I live on and it is proposed for a bike lane or a transit corridor, this is what I can expect maybe in the future as we implement some of these recommendations. So the first, we do have some regional connectors. Those are streets that are really regional. Broad Street is the prime, one of the primary examples. Uh, it is designed and currently uh, provides movements for regional significant trips. But as part of that, we think they should have buses and transit and sidewalks along them. So you'll see that as a consistent theme throughout. But there are some streets you want to say are of higher priority. The next, uh, the transit cr uh, priority corridors that Scudder talked about. Again, you want to have, it doesn't have to be a dedicated transit lane. Uh, and again, we're leaving it open. We have another cross-section that shows it could be in the middle of the road, a median running type of a transit facility. But it's the concept that you want to have a median, uh, lanes for cars, lanes for transit, and then wide sidewalks. It's that sort of creating a place for transit to operate more efficiently. Uh, then uh, there are some, Cary Street, downtown, there are just great streets, what we call a main street. And those are those neighborhood commercial centers. In those cross sections, you want to have people be able to park. You want people to be able to bike. And then you want to have traditional travel nodes as well. So those are really those streets which have a lot of churn and turnover. And really, it creates a good commercial district. Parking is a fundamental component of a strong commercial district. Uh, bicycle streets, we have given some various different cross sections to show this is what my street would look like if it becomes a bicycle street or a bicycle route is proposed on it. It could be a dedicated lane. Uh, basically, Scudder talked about a cycle track potential downtown on Main and Franklin. What that is, is it's an additional buffer in between this bike lane. So there's even more space and it really transforms the way bicyclists can commute very safely. And so that is one of the concepts. But we wanted people to see what a bike road would look like. A connector street, this is really something that's connecting a residential area to another area. These are the only streets where we think parking might be restricted. When the purpose of the street and the land use might be more industrial or, or open, where you really are just trying to get from point A to B, there are certain streets that really are about moving. But again, we've put in the sidewalks, the bikes. We think a consistent message is complete streets throughout the city. Neighborhood street, again, uh, the, the importance of on-street parking. So we have uh, our cross-sections all include parking within most of the residential streets and the residential areas. It's a fundamental sort of component within the city. And the final concept is what is called a green street. It's an emerging type of uh, nomenclature around the U.S. And that is really a street with wide mediums, planting strips, um, things like um, pervious pavers used to really capture the water and feed the gardens along the street. We think there's some tremendous opportunity looking at some of the streets heading down toward the James to really think about transforming and creating. These are the most walkable streets with green canopies. So really thinking about there should be some places in the city of Richmond that have those types of streets. I just want to touch as well on the, the safety uh, and operational type of recommendations that we've got. Um, we have a number of recommendations on um, sidewalk expansion. Uh, it's not just a complete streets issue, it's also a safety issue. There's large swaths, particularly in the south side, where we don't have sidewalks at all. And we've looked at the combination of transit access, uh, school access, and community center access, and noted some high priority areas where we need to add sidewalks uh, in the uh, as high priorities. 
Uh, we also have a number of recommendations for some other streets where they're very narrow two-lane streets now with no sidewalks or anything. Uh, and you, you really need to look at improvements that address not just the vehicular issues of congestion at intersections, perhaps and safety at intersections, but also sidewalks and, and so on. Uh, we have a number of recommendations for improvements to uh, grade crossings, uh, especially along the CSX line on the south side and up here on the north side, um, where uh, there's older crossings that uh, the, they don't have a significant history of crash uh, incidents overall, but they could be improved to reduce uh, the potential. Uh, major pedestrian crossings downtown and around VCU where you have really, really high flow pedestrian crossings at fairly uh, unsafe conditions, particularly at 95 Broad and 14th Street, and then uh, 9th and Canal and Bird, we have some recommendations for improvements uh, to those intersections. Uh, as well as I-95 interchange improvements, both for access and safety purposes. Uh, some of those interchanges don't have full access, so they really do need full access uh, in all directions and uh, for safety purposes. Uh, and then we have a series of recommendations for potential roundabouts uh, at a number of intersections where the volumes uh, and, the, and the dynamics appear to be um, uh, good candidates for potential roundabouts, which would uh, improve safety uh, basically in all cases. Uh, and then the one-way streets, which I believe we've talked with you all about before, um, we did a, a corridor level analysis and also a, a geometric analysis, i.e. looking at the width of the street uh, and, and some of the turning radii. Uh, and we analyzed those streets that were recommended for conversion in the downtown master plan. And in green, we've highlighted those streets that, based on both the geometry of the street and the, the traffic levels, um, you could go out and convert them tomorrow, we think, with no real issues. Uh, maybe a couple of places where you might lose a parking spot or two, um, but overall there sh wouldn't really be any issues. Uh, in blue, we've highlighted those streets where uh, we think conversion makes sense, uh, but there would need to be a little more detailed design work done for some specific intersections because you're likely to get some congestion due to the new left turn movements. Um, so you probably need to do some left turn lanes, you might lose some parking spaces at certain intersections. So a little bit of extra work, not necessarily much, would need to go into uh, actually converting those. Um, in the light red, we've noted streets where we simply think between the really tight turning radius and the very, very narrow nature of the streets, it just doesn't make sense to convert them, uh, period. Uh, and then in red, the darker red, we've highlighted those streets where based on the high level of traffic and the corridor level analysis that we did, we don't think it makes sense to convert them, that you would lead, it would lead to, to very, very high levels of congestion if you did convert them. Um, now we did a fairly overall corridor level analysis here, so it doesn't mean, for example, there's been discussion, uh, I think, of certain segments of Main Street or, uh, or others to perhaps convert. Uh, so you could still do a block and intersection level analysis to see if perhaps certain segments could be converted. Um, but overall, we think these corridors make sense to remain one-way streets. Uh, and this also ties back to our cycle track recommendation again. Um, that's all right. Franklin, Maine, by keeping them one way, you maintain that, that capacity uh, for moving traffic and the uh, capability to easily take one lane of parking, perhaps, to do that cycle track that we recommend. So it kind of fits in as well with the, with the bicycle recommendations there. Uh, when you get the full plan document, you'll see we have a whole range of other recommendations as well, uh, particularly policy recommendations on land use, um, looking at uh, transit-oriented development um, and uh, higher density in those transit corridors. Uh, parking improvements through parking policy changes, uh, and then system preservation recommendation, which really boils down to uh, you know, focusing on sidewalk repair, uh, paving programs, and, and um, looking at ways of increasing the funding for those. Uh, and then we also have a series of projects looking at, at port improvements and access improvements there. Um, and so you'll find that uh, in your matrix in Chapter 7, but also in more detail in Chapter 6 of the report. Well, a couple more. Um, uh, we do have a, a, an overall project matrix. This just lists all the things that are in here. We wanted to give time frames as well. So what projects should be, could be done in a short time frame? 
what project could be done in a medium time frame. And there are really some of those investments are quite long term <laughs> projects. So we wanted to acknowledge that. But we've given you cost estimates and sort of lead agency as well. Because some of them are more planning and some of them are definitely public works. And so we've given recommendations uh, for those as well. Um, in ranking and looking at them, when it, if you ask me what the story of this plan is, it really is about bike and pedestrian and transit improvements. Those are the projects that really rose to the top when you compare them to the guiding principles and the input we received consistently through this process. So those are the highest ranked projects overall. There are a number of complete streets that also did well because the safety needs are so great. In the middle are various other things, things like the one-way street conversions, which we know have gotten a lot of interest overall. Again, from a regional mobility multimodal, they don't do that much. And in fact, some of the conversions, if you converted them, you couldn't fit transit in <laughs> if you went from one way to two way. Some of the bike and pet, some of the lower volume ones go into the middle as well. Uh, some of the safety and vehicular, they're still important, but if they didn't have a multimodal component, they didn't perform as well necessarily. Next. Those that didn't perform well overall, and again, we're careful to say if it's in the plan, it is worthy of consideration as part of the master planning process goes forward, as part of regional planning. Uh, those projects that were really only targeted to one mode. We do have some places where we're recommending additional left turn lanes, where it's an intersection improvement, where it really doesn't have a bike, a multimodal, it's not necessarily sustainable as such. So we do have those overall. Again, those still could be, if it's a low cost, easy to implement, it's still something that could happen in the short term time frame. So the way the matrix works, it gives you a lot of flexibility as you program your projects. And that was really one of the goals of the plan overall. So again, um, we, it is still draft plan. We will make it uh, publicly available for you. It will be in draft form as long as, as we need. We will then take all of the comments, at our public workshop, we will again provide the plan and develop some interactive exercises. Uh, the list of projects have been presented publicly. The guiding principles were all presented publicly as well, and we gave people the opportunity to identify anything new as well. But we will continue that process so that people can really, now it's packaging. We've put it all together in one package that people can look at it together. One of the things people have asked for that we will do is, as you can tell, there's a lot of overlapping, so you may have a bike and a transit on your route proposed. We'll give some graphics to explain that and say, but so people can really see it as we move forward as part of that planning process. Then our schedule is to wrap this up. Hopefully, by May, we, we've made a lot of revisions based on input we just got from stakeholders and uh, our internal group. Um, but that is our overall plan going forward, and at this point, we will take any questions. Yeah, this I'll just add that you know, the, the plan will be available on the website and we'll have an opportunity not just at the public workshop in April but also via the website to comment um, on any aspect of the documented plan. We had an interactive survey as part of one of the earlier parts of the guiding principles and it, it really looks like a PowerPoint but then you can put in your own comments on each of the principles and we use that to help rank it as well. We'll do something similar when the plan is available so that you can comment throughout the plan in an interactive way. Thank you guys very much. Are there comments or questions? I see Mr. Agilowski. Sorry. Can you give us the web address? Uh, it is on the city's economic development page. We'll have to send that link to you yeah, all. Yeah, um, there used to be links on it. I think the city, that page has just been redesigned recently. And we are going to talk to them next week to add a quick links on the right hand side of it. And that's where we'll put the plan. I see Dr. New. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Agilowski, you can go ahead and mark them. Okay, Dr. Newbill and then Mr. Bologna. Just uh, the location for the public workshop? It will be at the VDOT Auditorium right across the street. That was my question. <laughs> Back to Mr. Adelasta. Uh, April 11th. Yes. Um, <clears throat> on the, the document, you've got great illustrations of the different road types and how we can combine these things. Clearly, the city already has the infrastructure in place. Um, I, I take it that the analysis has kind of measured the width of the roads and is identifying which road types therefore can be accommodated on our existing infrastructure or are you also making recommendations to changing widths of roads to accommodate for a change in our multimodal 
use of the city's grid? At this point, we do not have specific width recommendations in the plan. Um, that was sort of a level of detail. And you'll find, I think, in places where they've done street types, that because of the variable, you want to have a certain street type apply in different widths. So we have it, that's just a level of detail that's greater than we have in this plan. So ours will be illustrative in terms of the pieces, but how all the pieces fit really becomes a public works and a next step type exercise. I see Ms. Trammell, but I see Dr. Newell again. I'm sorry. Ms. Robinson had her hand up first. I'm sorry, Mr. Robinson. Oh, no, I'm, go ahead. I don't know if I had my hand up first. I'm sorry, go ahead. You want me to ask you a question, too? What time is the meeting on the public uh, workforce? We are still confirming. We're trying, we would like to get the mayor to do an introduction. Most likely it will be from 5.30 to 7.30 but we've not fully confirmed. We've got it blocked out from five to nine. Okay. Uh, my, my comment, thank you for the presentation. Um, am I understanding that this plan will be used to ultimately amend a master plan for the city, become a part of a master document, planning document for the city? That, that is our understanding. That <clears throat> What happened in 1997 was we, there was a transportation plan that then is used as an input to the master plan. So Vicki could probably give more details, but that is this intent that this is a technical document. And it will be amended to the master plan. It will be used as an input to the master plan. So they can still determine which pieces, correct, go in or out of. So it is the technical analysis that can be used to build the transportation component of the overall master plan. Okay. And of, of, uh, the idea is that the planning is looking, planning development review is looking at doing a new master plan here very soon. So this would be an input into their process. Okay. Yeah, once it's funded. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all <y> fund it. <laughs> Ms. Trammell? I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You're continuing I'm, on? Yeah, I'm not finished quite. I'm, but I will be quickly, I hope. Um, one of the things that. Um, as far as transportation is concerned, a lot of our older neighborhoods have um, streets that are wide enough to be three lanes <laughs> um, that would serve very well for multimodal uses and those kinds of things. But I was particularly interested in your transit map that showed your routes, and I can't seem to find that. Uh, this one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in knowing one of the recent one of the things that have been very we've been very interested in attempting to uh, get for transit is to provide opportunities for our regional connection to workforce centers, um, and there there appears to be um, maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but. We have a really nice shopping center out at the end of um, um, called um, not Short Point Stony Point, Stony Point. Mm -hmm. um, and there I don't see any major transit going we, that direction. We did have we have had input on that. There there are some challenges in that area because of density. So in terms of running transit, the densities are so low and it is so suburban and characteristic that it would have to be almost a destination type of transit. We have been asked to look at something in that vicinity and even more circumferential to connect some of those routes on that particular arc that is definitely missing. So that is something that, um, that, is something that we are evaluating right now is that whole section does look underserved. And the, the other thing to point out is that that, that particular map is of what we're calling the transit priority corridors, which would be the highest frequency, highest level of service transit routes, not the network in and of itself. So the idea would also be that you, there is a general improvement in the overall service, the local and express service um, for yeah. GRTC. It could general, be a lower level. So that that area could still be served and should probably be served by a yeah. local service, but it might not be as frequently as significant as the services on those corridors would be. One more question. Yeah. Is it, um, it has been said 
that one of the reasons why we don't have more ridership on our existing transit, one of the reasons, one of many, uh, is that we are so automobile friendly. And whether or not there were, in order for us to encourage more transit riders, as to whether or not we would become less automobile friendly by the degree of parking that we provide in garages and those kinds of things. Um, and the demand that we place on development as it relates to parking spaces that feeds into that. Was any of that taken into any discussion and whether or not a internal circulator uh, within the downtown quarter would help us a lot as far as transit riding? We did have discussions about an internal circulator right now, uh, before. It did not emerge to the point that we added a project. Okay. We do have some language in there about parking, because it is correct. The relationship